Now, we've been talking about why is there so much pain in life? Uh, has anybody experienced some pain? Maybe some of you are in some form of pain tonight. Um, and it's just part of life. We've been establishing these, uh, these principles. And if we want to look on our outlines very quickly, you see what's already filled out. It should be everything on the front side of your outline. In the course of going through life and uh, coming to places where we have more questions and answers and struggles and trials, all these things along the way that life brings, remember that God always invites us to ask. He wants us to be engaged with him in discourse and conversation, and it's called prayer, right? Uh, it never ceases to amaze me how when people pray, and they don't, they don't really expect God to answer. I mean, they expect him to answer the prayer, but they don't expect him to answer them. So what do you mean? Uh, I can't tell you the amount of people that we've ministered to over the years where we've said, well, then listen. Pray. You know what prayer really is? Talking to the Lord. It's not getting complicated. It's not trying to complicate things. It's not trying to memorize prayers. That's religious. And the Lord doesn't want that. He wants reality. So just talk to him. And then what? And then spend, take some time to just stay still. I mean, Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, be still. And know that I am, I am God. Well, how can we really know by revelation? Wow, he's really God, and he's God in my life. Unless we be still. We can't be running 100 miles an hour and expect to really move in some deep revelation. Any more than you can get into a relationship with someone long distance. I mean, if you really want to take it to where it needs to go, you need to spend time with that person, correct? And get to know one another. Well, that's what the Lord wants from us. He knows us, but we don't know him. Well, he said, I'm making myself available to you, and it's called prayer. You talk to me, but listen, and expect me to talk back to you. Now, I'm not talking about something weird. You know, you pray, and then you say, okay, are my walls going to shake? Is, am I going to hear a voice, hey, you? I don't mean that, but I'll tell you what, nine times out of ten, 99 times out of 100, he whispers into your heart. He may give you a dream. He may give you a vision. Uh, many times what he does is he brings repeated thoughts over and over again, deep impressions into your heart, into your spirit. So pay attention to those things because that's some of the ways in which he answers us back. And many times when, when he's doing that, if we say, Lord, is this you? Well, you know, what's going on here? He said, well, you prayed. He will, he will hook us back up with a prayer that we had prayed. And this is the answer that he's getting, but it doesn't mean it's instantaneous. You pray this week, he may answer you next week. But it will be an answer. And so you pay attention to that. Obviously, you don't run away crazy with some kind of impression because it could be the triple jalapeno pizza uh, and not the impression of the Lord. But uh, so you don't, you don't do goofy things. Uh, whatever it is, it's got to first line up with God's word and it's got to make sense on other levels as well. Uh, but all in all, he wants, us to, he, wants to, he wants us to move expectantly in that we pray, he can answer. And leave it up to him as to how he's going to answer, right? Um, but he invites us to ask. You see the second blank, because his ultimate goal is to take us through a process and bring us to a point where we what? Believe. We believe him. We walk in a greater faith each and every day than we did the previous day, or every month, or every year, and it's called growing, right? Spiritual depth. Our spiritual depth is increasing, and so we're moving from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory. That is the process of Christian growth. All right, now, um, because when somebody first comes to the Lord, they're believing God on a certain level. They know Him on a certain level. And that level at that moment is the level of his saviorhood. They know he's done something in their heart. He's done something in their life. He's redeemed them from the world. And he's kind of, uh, you know, they're born again. They're in a relationship with Jesus. Their name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And all that is great. But 
It's the beginning of the journey. But always with him, the best is yet to come. All right, so Roman numeral two, he wants our hearts, excuse me, and not just our minds. So he wants to move us to a place uh, where he's got our whole heart. Because that's where the battle comes in sometimes. He wants our whole heart. He wants to be number one in our lives. More than our job, more than money, more than any other human relationship, even more than our husband or our wife, our loved one, more than our children. He just simply needs to be number one. His priorities in our life, his agenda, his plans, what's important to him has to all transition into a number one position, the 12 o'clock position on a clock. Because if he's not in the 12 o'clock position, we're going to have a problem. Our clock is going to be all out of whack, and all our priorities will be out of whack. How many of you ever noticed in your own life that when your priorities got out of whack, nothing good comes of that? Right? Um, I remember many, many cases. Um, someone has, you know, come and told Debbie and I, and the Lord gave me a new job. Well, what's the job? And they would tell us whatever the job was, and uh, we said, well, what does it involve? Well, you know, I got to work 80 hours a week, but he said after about a year, it'll get better. But listen, the, but, you know, but here's the point. Many times they'll say, but I've been praying for a job, and so this has to be it. So now hold on. You have a wife, you have children, or you have a husband, you have children, you have a household to maintain. You have a spiritual life to take care of. Uh, working 80 hours a week, are you going to be able to do that? I don't think so. 80 hours a week, what are you going to possibly have left to give in your tank? <laughs> to your spouse or to your children? You're going to be burnt out. So you better be careful of taking that job. Because it might look good and you might need the money, but be careful of launching into that too quickly. Because... If you say no to that one based upon larger priorities, the Lord can open up the proper door the very next day. So not everything that looks good is necessarily the one for you, right? So we have to use wisdom. You've got to look at the bigger picture. And part of that is he wants our hearts and not our minds. When, we, when he has our hearts, he can speak this wisdom into our hearts and lives. And that's what he wants. Okay, so let's go to Roman numeral three now. And we'll finish this series up tonight by addressing the question, why is there pain in life? Why does life have to hurt so much? And everyone that you will meet in life, they will have gone through pain. They're probably in some place of pain in their life now. And part of what allows us and enables us to minister into their lives is the fact that we are no strangers to the same kind of pain. C.S. Lewis said this, pain plants the flag of reality in the fortress of a rebel heart. Pain plants the flag of reality into the fortress of a rebel heart. Now listen, he goes on to say, for God whispers to us in our pleasures, he speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to get the attention of a deaf world. Wow. Isn't that incredible? And John Selden said this, Pleasure is nothing else but the intermission of pain. Pleasure is nothing else but the intermission of pain. Like if you have the first half of a football game, second half, the intermission, that's pleasure. So get ready after the first half. You know, give it enough time, the second half will come around in one shape or form or another. It's just part, uh, a part of reality. Okay, now, <clears throat> it doesn't mean your life has to be coming unglued, but there'll be some, there'll be some things that you're going to be wrestling with and struggling with um, that's going to come our way, and that's just the way it is. So, why does life have to hurt so much? First and foremost, when it comes to, into the realm of interpersonal relationships for sure, 
it's because we love deeply. And this is certainly the reality for Christians. If you're a Christian and God has sensitized your heart, one of the things that comes to pass as a result of that sensitizing is that you love at a deeper level. Your heart is open. You love God, you love people, uh, and anytime you get involved in interpersonal relationships, you become vulnerable to disappointment, you become vulnerable to pain. Uh, but that's just the way it is. Look at the second scripture right under point number one, and we covered this uh, last week. Psalmist David said, even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food at my table, has turned against me. Wow, that's pretty powerful, huh? And so David was no stranger to pain, and he's writing the Psalms out of his place of personal pain and disappointment in that he felt betrayed, backstabbed, and abandoned by someone that was supposed to have been a supporter and someone loyal. And so when you love deeply, you're going to open yourself up to vulnerable, to, uh, vulnerable places. However, if you pull back from all that, um, you're going to live a barren, sterile existence. It's just, there's just no other way to go about it. If you're going to love, you have to risk. You have to risk pain. You have to risk being hurt. Uh, the reason life will hurt so much is when you care. When you care, you get the blessing of relationships, and you get the blessing of that uh, reciprocal emotion. However, at the same time, you become vulnerable to pain and disappointment and all of this kind of stuff. You know, if God's goal for us was to have a painless life, then Jesus would have given that as an example. But when he lived, he lived everything but a painless life. So he said, I am your role model. Follow me. As you see me live, that's the way you live. And guess kind of the life he lived? It was filled with pain. It was filled with a lot of pleasure and a lot of victories and you know, he fulfilled the mission of his father, which was to go to the cross and bring redemption. But along the way, he had tremendous, uh, he suffered tremendous pain, disappointment, uh, discouragement, fatigue, all of these things. Uh, he was spoken of wickedly. He was misrepresented, lied about, but that's part of life. Now, often we think that life should be smooth and uh, trouble-free and without pain, but uh, many times when there's pain that comes about, we have to look because God might be revealing something that needs to be resolved. Uh, you know, one of the things that is said is that one of God's greatest gifts to mankind is pain. Now, <laughs> we may not think so, and I'll tell you what, that's a gift I'd like not to have. How about you? Um, but many times when pain comes about, it's an opportunity to resolve something. It's an opportunity to fix something. It's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to go to another level. Um, because think about the difference of that as opposed to maybe a lot of the relationships, quote unquote, that you might have in the workplace, where you talk to people you work with, but they're not your friends necessarily. You don't hang out with them. Does anybody ever have a bunch of people in the office that you say hello to? You know their name, they know your name, and you get together, you talk about this or that, you have coffee, you know, you share, you have a common goal, which is uh, ostensibly to advance the company and the company's directives and agenda, but after that, you don't hang out with them. Maybe you never hang out with them. Maybe the most time you ever talk to in your life is if they have a company picnic or a Christmas banquet. And even then, it's for those couple of hours, then you never talk to them again. Now, that's not a relationship. That's an acquaintance. It's a business acquaintance. It's a teammate for one specific purpose, which is the company's goals. But it doesn't mean you have a relationship with them. Right? You're not even interested in that. So when you come to that place and you 
are in that level of acquaintance-based uh, connection, if they were to say something bad about you, you'd say, whatever. Right? Because they're not in the deepest part of your heart. They're not in the deepest part of your life. You have not opened up the depths of your heart to that person because you never hang out with them and you have no interest in hanging out with them. So if they say something to you, it's not going to hurt you to the depth of who you are. But someone that you know, you love, you trust, and then they say something terrible about you or they do something to you, man, that hurts. You know why? Because when you're vulnerable, or very often you never see it coming. And they're the last person on the planet you'd expect it from. And so it nails you. However, if you don't come to those places of relationship, you'll never have the joys of relationship. So that's the catch-22. It's the paradox. Um, Billy Graham said this, Out of pain and problems have come the sweetest songs and the most gripping stories ever written. And then of all people, Hanoi Jane. Jane Fonda said this, when you can't remember why you're hurt, that's when you know you're healed. It's amazing coming from her. So, but it's, but it's, it's good. Okay, so that's number one. Because we love deeply. This is a world, and we are a people in general, human beings have been designed by God for relationships. No one has been designed by God to be a weird hermit on a mountaintop. Honestly, even this whole monastery-based thing that religious orders do, that's really never been a plan of God. The last thing that Jesus said before he left the planet, essentially, was go into all the world and share the gospel to all creation. That pretty much says to me, engage humanity. Where does a monastery fit into that picture? Nowhere. See, it's man's best effort to somehow feel holy by self-consecration, but missing the whole point in the process. You're so holy that no one gets to enjoy your holiness. Well, that's all goofed up. Jesus said, I'm holy and I'm righteous. I'm the example that you need. And I'm going to walk among you for you to see it, that this stuff works. And if it worked for me, it will work for you. Jesus didn't hide himself away in a birdhouse, a treehouse somewhere. He walked among, in fact, he walked to the depths of humanity. He sat down with the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes and people that were down and out. Not only them, but he wasn't afraid to engage all kinds of people because he knew who he was and he knew what his mission was and he knew that the power of love and goodness and light and life and anointing would overcome the power of sin and death. He wasn't afraid of it. It was afraid of him. And so if you take the, the model of the, the monks, if you take the model of nuns, and if you take the model even of the Amish, it doesn't jive with Scripture. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in the wider scheme of what the Scriptures say. It works in a very limited basis. It's true, if you don't spend a lot of time with unbelievers and, you know, wicked sinners and all this kind of stuff, it's, it's true, you could probably keep your spiritual walk uh, tighter more easily, but you're missing the wider picture of why we're here in the first place in doing so. We're not here to try and just hang on until the bitter, gory end. We're here to be difference makers and change agents and lights in a dark place. Because if we're not the light of the world, Jesus said, hey, I, when I was among you, I was the light of the world, but now I'm going away. So guess what? You're the light of the world, and you're the salt of the earth. 
He said, no one in their right mind lights a lamp and then makes sure they put the bushel basket over the top of it. It defeats the whole purpose of the light. Well, that's what he means. When you get this beautiful light, maybe a brand new flashlight, and you make sure you wrap it in black duct tape, including the lens. You just understand, you're defeating the whole purpose of what a light is supposed to do. And so we're, our walk with the Lord is supposed to be real enough to be able to walk anywhere and keep it together. If it's not that real, and I'm not talking about, hey, I know I am in Christ, so I'm going to walk in every bar in Middletown. I'm not talking about that. That's just goofball stuff, and that's, a, that's really tempting and testing the Lord in a way that you shouldn't. Uh, that's not even the point. The point is you're going to run into enough people and engage enough people in the normal course of your life without needing to go into a bar to say, well, I'm evangelizing. Yeah, what are you doing the other seven days a week? You don't see enough people? Is that the problem? That's goofy. You're looking for an excuse to sin. Okay, number two. The second reason why there's pain in life and life hurts so much, that first, because we become vulnerable and we love deeply. And that's one source of pain that we got to grapple with. Second, we can run into pain in life when we have the wrong goals. Now, when I say wrong goals, I mean wrong priorities, number one. But I want to get very specific about wrong goals. In a singular sense... A wrong goal would be this, to believe that you can have a goal in life to live a pain-free existence. If your goal in life is to live a pain-free existence, it's going to fail you. You're never going to be able to pull that off because it's a wrong premise. You can't insulate yourself well enough to ever be free from pain and still be a normal functioning person. Um, Scientists tell us that if, you're, if the basic premise from which you are working, your calculations, is incorrect to begin with, then every other subsequent calculation is going to be wrong. If the basic premise is wrong, then every calculation and every uh, number that you come up with is going to be in itself wrong because your starting place, your starting position is incorrect. There are some people that believe that if they try hard enough, their goal that they can focus in on is to live a painless life. Uh, if that's someone's foundation, uh, I'm sorry, reasoning, then their foundation of thought is wrong. It's incorrect. It's inaccurate. You can't do that. Think about what would happen in the short term. If that's our philosophy that governs our life, we would never right wrongs or be inclined to resolve conflicts. Think about it. If my goal in life was to uh, live a pain-free existence, then I would never have an incentive to right wrongs or to resolve conflicts because I just wouldn't care. But what kind of life do, am I left with now? And if I think I'm going to have God's best with that kind of incorrect philosophy governing my life, it's going to be a mess. I'm going to be shocked every time I get hurt. I'm going to be shocked every time I get disappointed. I'm going to be shocked and blown away. When we go with this kind of philosophy, we can become selfish and not care what happens to others because our goal in life is to isolate ourselves from it all. In other words, our chief goal in life would be our own comfort. And you can't look at yourself and say, my chief goal is my own comfort and actually care about other people. There's, there won't be enough room on your plate for both of those guiding philosophies. Now look at the scriptures here under point number two. It says in Psalm 11, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundational thought is wrong, then what, how are we going to, what are we going to build on? If the foundations are destroyed, it doesn't really matter 
how much you spend on your building material if the foundation is shot? Of course not. It's ridiculous. That's like, that's like some builder builds a house on a 10-degree tilt, right? The foundation is like this, and then they spend $2 million on building materials. Well, who's going to buy the house? Understand the house is useless because the foundation was wrong, laid incorrectly. Now, you see the second scripture, Proverbs 18 and verse 14. It says, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? So our goal in life can't be to live a pain-free life. That's not going to work. Because then when we do get zapped, we're going to have a broken spirit. Part of growing in life is to sustain blows, trust God, and come back stronger. If not, we're not going to make it. Because look at, the, uh, look at the choices that we have here. That if our spirit is strong, if our heart is strong, if our foundation is strong, we can endure anything, even through times of sickness. But if our spirit is broken, then we will fail, we'll collapse. So you know what the point is here? Our internal condition, our internal health is more important and more strategic than anything on the outside. Because if our heart is strong, if we know who we are, if we're strong on the inside, it doesn't matter what comes our way, we might go down on the canvas, but we're going to get back up again. But if we're weak on the inside, then the smallest blow puts us down. Jim Rohn said this, the difference in life is this, pain weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. He said, you're going to have either the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. You got to choose which one. I'd rather have the pain of discipline than the pain of regret. Because regret tends to haunt you for a long time. Mary Tyler Moore, the late Mary Tyler Moore said, pain nourishes courage. You can't be brave if you've had only wonderful things happen to you in life. So there's something about pain that awakens something in our soul. I'm not saying we rejoice about it, but I'm telling you, it awakens something in us. It awakens a warrior spirit. It awakens the will to fight. It awakens us to what this whole thing is that we're involved in. Or it shows us what we're lacking. Either way, it gives us the opportunity to change. Are you guys okay tonight? If, we're, if our goal is to live a painless life, then the enemy has set us up with a wrong set of goals. Because if our goal is to live a painless life, then listen, inevitably, it's all going to be about us. Because I'm going to be the most important person in that equation. So how can it be about me and about you? If my goal is to live a pain-free life, that means I'm not going to make myself vulnerable here. I'm not going to disclose this. I'm not going to be real with you. I'll smile at you. I'll do this, but no one's going to really get to, get to know me. I'm not letting you in. Uh, and I'm not going to deal with the issues of my past because that brings me pain in the present. Well, what am I going to be left with when that all plays out? The issues of your past just aren't going to go away. In fact, they're skewing they're messing with your worldview now. Even though they might be a little quiet from during season to season, they're still going to be messing with how you're viewing yourself, others, God, or life. Think about this. If we want a pain-free existence, if that's our number one goal, then we won't even want God to change us because it might cause a little pain along the way. I remember years ago, and Debbie and I were brand new Christians, and uh, we went to this meeting one night, 
We had a guest speaker from California, this pretty well-known pastor. Apparently, he was very well-known because we were such young Christians. We weren't familiar with a lot of big names in uh, Christianity. And this guy was pretty well-known. And <clears throat> so we were excited. People were saying, oh, this guy's coming. Oh, okay. So we showed up at the meeting. It was a special service. And this guy did a great job. I mean, he was just wonderful. He did a great job preaching, wonderful thing that he did. And all throughout his message, he was sharing these stories that really brought to life the points that he was making in his message, like hopefully that I'm doing right now. <laughs> and so at the, at the end of that whole message, he closed the service out and and Debbie and I, I leaned over to her, but then she leaned over to me quick, and she said, wow, wasn't that great? I said, yeah, man, it was, that guy was good. And, you know, he made sense, and it was real. And, but I look, and she leaned over, she said, man, wouldn't it be nice to have that, those stories, stories like that? And I imagine the Holy Spirit saying, uh-huh, well, you're going to have them all right. Oh, I will answer that prayer. See, little did we know, every one of those stories he shared was true, and almost every one of them came out of a place of great pain. We didn't know, but looking back at what he shared, <laughs> oh, he paid the price of admission, so he was going to ride every ride in the park. So you're going to pay the price of admission, you may as well ride the rides, because you're paying to get in the park anyway. And uh, what I'll tell you, what gave his words life was that they were backed up with experience and they were seasoned with pain. Many times we want everything from God but experience. But experience is the only thing that changes you. So guess what he's going to do? He said, I know you prayed for everything but experience, but because I love you, I'm going to load you up with experience. And then you'll have the other things on top of that. And uh, we pay for each experience. So to live this foolish life, you know, Jesus said it this way, he who tries to preserve his life will lose it. Anyhow, but whoever freely gives me his life will gain it, plus eternal life on top of that. I'm paraphrasing there. This is what he's saying. If you think you're going to preserve your own life and save your own life and deliver your own life and keep your life free in this regard, he said, forget about it. You're going to lose it. But if you trust me with your future, if you trust me with your experiences, if you trust me with your pain, then I'll give it all back to you with interest. But many times we want everything but, but experience. But if we're going to be a vital part of life, and if we're going to have a vital part in God's plan, and we want the fullness of the destiny that he has for each one of us, we got to be willing to experience it. Now, third, is this making sense to you guys? All right, third, we're going to finish up with this. So the reason why there's pain in life is first, on the relational level, it's because when we love deeply, we become vulnerable deeply. Second, it's when we have wrong goals in life and don't even realize it, we're going to get hurt by default. And third, the third reason why there's pain is we live in, supposed to be a world of sin and rebellion. We live in a world of sin and rebellion. That's just a fact for all of us. We live in a world of sin. Why are there murderers? Sin. Why are there atheists? Rebellion. Why are there, you know, sin? Well, why is this going on? Sin. Why is there greed? Sin. Why do people rip each other up? Sin. 
Why do people mug other people? Sin. Just about anything you can even imagine saying, the answer will be sin and rebellion of mankind. Which the devil nurtures and Jesus has come to deliver from. There are people in this world, I don't know if you've met any of them, but I've met a few, that have no morals and they don't care about other people. If you don't believe me, look at Hollywood. Look at the messages that's housed in so many movies that young kids watch and that stuff is getting sown into them like seeds in the ground. You know what the long-term... You know what the larger message is that's usually hidden in small uh, illustrations in those things? Is that ultimately speaking, there's no such thing as absolute truth. If you think something's right, it's right to you. If I think something's wrong, it's only wrong to me. Doesn't mean it's wrong on a, on a clinical, provable level. Just means whatever you think is right, whatever I think is right might be radically different, but it means it's right to you. If it's right to me, who cares? There's no such thing as ultimate right and wrong. Well, guess what the Bible says? This is the ultimate goal of right, what's right and what's wrong. Anything outside, and then this is a beautiful part about the Bible. It was never written to a time frame in history or to a particular people. It was written that addresses the human condition, which is always in sin and rebellion and in need of a Savior. And so the beauty about God's Word and how He's preserved it for thousands of years is that it cuts through your opinion and mine. It cuts through the emotions of a matter and gets to the spiritual heart of truth. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you say. The guy down the street, the guy in the bar, doesn't matter what the atheist says. It doesn't matter. God says... My word is forever settled in heaven and forever binding on earth. And even if someone doesn't believe it, they're still bound to it and bound by it and judged by it. Just like the law of gravity. Well, I don't believe that. Well, I don't believe that. Well, then step out of a fourth floor window, fourth story window. Argue with it on the way down with an umbrella. It doesn't matter that you don't believe it. It matters what is. So I just don't believe that. Well, then don't believe it. It doesn't negate truth. Truth is always truth. The law of gravity is always the law of gravity. Unless Jesus comes and says, go ahead and walk on the water or step out of that window, unless he says that, which he can do if he wants to because he's the one who set this whole thing up in the first place. But can somebody say one in a gajillion times that's going to happen? Outside of that, as long as Genesis 8.22, as long as the earth remains, these things shall be binding. There'll be summer and winter and morning and night, seed time and harvest and cold and heat. Nah. Basically, he's saying all of the principles that govern environment and science and physics, etc., are all here because God set them here. And until time is eradicated and everything goes back to an eternal state when Christ comes. These things shall remain. So we live in a world of sin, and that's why we have so many problems. Look at the scripture here that speaks to you and I in the midst of all this craziness. Paul said to the Philippian church, and he says to us, you are to live clean, innocent lives as children of God, in a dark world that's filled with crooked and perverse people. Does it mean every person? No. He's talking about in a general sense. Uh, and he's really speaking more to us than about others. So he said, look, in the midst of people, a lot of people that you're going to meet that aren't serving me, that aren't walking with me, that have completely broken moral compasses, etc., you are to live a certain way to be the light for them, to point them to me. And if you live like them, you disqualify yourself from being the light. Live among them, but live differently than them. So he said, 
in the midst of all this chaos of this world, build your life on my word, and in doing so, you'll be building on solid rock and not sinking sand. And when you build on the solid rock, your house will stand when the storms come, when the floods rage, when the waves come, when the tsunamis come, when the winds blow, your house will be the one standing. Your family, your life, your relationship will be the one standing. So live clean, innocent lives. You know, look at the key thought. Did I put the key thought on your scripture there, on your notes? Whenever, wherever there is sin and sinful mankind, there will be pain and destruction. You see this nut job in North Korea? Is he any different than anybody else on the planet? No. Guess what he's living in? Sin and rebellion to Jesus. Or is, is it up there? Yeah. That's what he is. He's lost. He is an atheist. He's as lost as lost can be. The only reason why he sticks out is that he's in an influential, visible political position on the planet. But what about all the other people that swirl around your life every day that are rebellious to God's laws in their own way? But in terms of popularity, they're nobodies. They don't get any ink. They don't get the press. But understand that what drives this guy in Korea is obviously the devil. Uh, but what gives in road to the devil in that man's life is that he's an atheist and he's in rebellion to God and God's laws. He hasn't given his heart to Christ and his heart is hard and his heart is full of the world. Wow. If our whole hope is in this world alone, we're going to be massively frustrated and just disappointed. Our hope is in Christ alone. Our trust is in the name of the Lord. And God places people like you and I in this broken world to give people the news that in Christ there's hope beyond this world. I had guys talking in the gym. What do you think? Hey, what do you think about this guy? Is he going to push the button? Remember when things were really heating up a few weeks back? You think he's going to push the button? Oh, my God. There was somebody told me that the guy's got a button right on his desk. I said, he might. But listen, I don't care what this guy does. He's not going to push the button. How do I know that? Because there's too many unfulfilled prophetic things in Scripture for this guy to push the button now. I don't care what he's posturing. He ain't pushing the button. Someone might push him out of a third-story window before it happens. But he's not pushing any button. There are too many prophetic mile markers yet un, unfulfilled for this guy to do this, something like that because it's going to light the planet up green. So I'm not the least bit worried about this guy. He's going to die before all this stuff happens. When we live in Christ, we're going to realize sooner or later that our pain becomes secondary because we know that there's an eternal life beyond all this craziness. There's a life in Christ that is assured to us in Him. And because of that, we can maintain our peace in the midst of a lot of chaos and a lot of uncertainty and fears that people have. And we can be the ones who point the way to Christ and help others in their place of hurt, pain, and confusion. So, unless we can relate to people's pain and understand their confusion and are willing to live the kind of life that is put in positions to relate to what people are living through, how are we ever going to reach a hand out and reach people if we can't even relate to what they're going through? That's why the Lord allows us to go through things. And the Lord will be with us through it all. Look at this last scripture. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you, so that in me you might have peace. In the world you might, on occasion, have a tough time. Is that what he said? No. He doesn't say it's going to happen every day either. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. That means extreme pressure. I mean, like you're pulled through a knothole sideways. 
but be of good cheer. Take courage, for I have overcome the world. And if you walk in my shadow, you will overcome anything you face also, because I will empower you to do that. Pain will always be secondary if it's based upon a greater cause. If our greater cause is to glorify him and walk it out and be the light of the world and, you know, help others, pain becomes secondary. I want to give you two last, uh, not verses, but quotes. Robert Lee said, Robert Gary Lee said, wisdom is nothing more than healed pain. And Tom Carr said, God gave us pain to remind us that we are alive so that we will learn to value the joys and beauty of the life that he's given us. We can't always control everything that happens to us in this life, but we can control how we respond. Many struggles come as problems and pressures that cause pain. Others might come as temptation, trials, and tribulations, but we have the victory in all things in Christ. Thank you so much for joining us today. If God has impacted your life through this message, please join Victory in reaching people all around the world by sowing back into the kingdom today. You can give at rvictory.org slash give or download the Victory Church app and select Give. Find Victory on social media for bonus teachings and content all throughout the week. 